Ms. Dean? Here. Mr. Ferguson? Here. Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Spring? Mr. Strike? Here. Ms. Barker? Here. Mr. Walker? Here. Mr. Sporhays? Here. Mr. Cange? Present. Thank you. Mr. Spring was excused. I didn't get that out. Thank you very much. Do we have any comments or revisions from the minutes for Monday, February 2nd, or Monday, February 9th? Move to approve. Thank you very much. Do we have a second? Got a motion and a second. Seeing and hearing none, no objection. Those are approved. Ms. Dean, will you please handle the disclosures? Commissioner Bark uh, Barker, do you have anything to disclose? Yes, I do. Thank you, Ms. Dean. On the consent agenda, I was absent from um, the meeting at which both of these items were presented and therefore should not be voting on it. Commissioner Sporhays? Uh, none. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson? None. Commissioner Ferguson? I was also absent on the meeting when resolutions 215-004 and 215.07 were discussed, and so I will not be voting on those either. Commissioner Walker? Um, I have one disclosure. I don't think it's really that critical, but um, many, many years ago in another life, um, I did do some work for uh, David and Renee Mallers, uh, probably in conjunction with the bank uh, loan at the time I did some appraisal work uh, on a property that I think is probably connected to uh, our first public hearing case tonight. Yeah, case it's been postponed, Mr. Walker. Oh, okay. Well, no disclosures then. So good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Strike. Yes, three disclosures. On the consent agenda D1 on resolution 2015-004 and 007. I was not present at the Commission meeting that heard those two cases, so I will not be voting. And on item E1, the case 2014 that's 0173, that is a continuation from a meeting that I was not present, but I did hear and listen to the tape. Thank you. Commissioner Cange. No disclosures, thank you. I'd like to go back to 2014 0173. The Cook Inlet Marketing Group. I was also absent from one meeting on that, but I did also listen to the tape, so I am prepared to vote on that. Ms. Barker? I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I also was absent from that meeting, um, in which um, item 2014-0173 was previously discussed, but like my fellow commissioners, I did pull up the tape and listen to the other recordings and feel um, prepared and equipped to discuss, debate the issue. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Kane, do you want to make a motion then to adopt the consent agenda? Thank you. Through the chair, um, with regard to tonight's consent agenda, I move to approve uh, consent agenda, noting that Mr. Ferguson and Commissioner uh, Barker will not be, uh, right. will, will be abstaining. And Mr. Strike will be abstaining on uh, 007. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. Please use your machine. We got, if I voted, that would help everybody. We got uh, six, five votes yes, three abstentions. That passed. First case tonight is case 2114-0173, conditional use for a gas station. The public hearing is closed on that case. Um, we've had the staff report. I believe, does the staff have anything else to add at this point on that case? Mr. Chair, no, I don't have anything to add. Um, the petitioner has submitted a packet in answer to 
the questions that were posed uh, to him at the last meeting on February 9th. He is here tonight, and he has um, representatives from Chevron here to speak about re the reme remediation issues. And I believe a representative from DEC was to be here tonight as well. Okay. And the DEC is here. Um, I, I guess we're going to let's hear from the DEC first. And then we will go to um, the petitioner, and then we'll go from there. Anybody have any objection to that? If the representative from DEC is here, would you come forward and state your name for the record and spell it, please? My name is Robert Weimer, W-E-I-M-E-R, the uh, state of Alaska DEC, in the... Uh, Division of Spill Prevention and Response Contaminated Sites Program. Okay, thank you very much. Do you um, have a prepared report or do you just want to take questions? Just, I'm just here to answer any questions that you might have. Mr. Robertson, you seem, Mr. Robinson, you seem to have the most questions at the last meeting, so I'll start with you and we'll go from there. Thank you, through the chair, um, Robert. Um, I one of the one of the conditions um, that must be met in order to approve a conditional use permit um, is the one that stated will not have a permanent negative impact on the items listed below um, substantially greater than that anticipated from permitted development it does one of those is noise air water or other forms of environmental pollution and so the issue here is we're dealing with you know a site that is a known contaminated site and and then a conditional use that has the potential to lead to further contamination if things don't go the right way. I think that for the purposes of this board, if you could summarize, you know, we were given the, the listing from the DC's website that kind of gives the case history. But if you could, um, we're also dealing with two owners, sort of a former owner that you're working with and a new owner that's coming in to operate this facility. So for our purposes, could you just summarize short synopsis of the history, some of the re remediation, kind of where it stands today vis-a-vis -vis DC. Okay. Um, if you want specific dates, I can... It doesn't have to be, you know, okay. that there was some, you know, the, yeah. the extent of the release that was several years ago, they've right. been kind of, have they followed everything that's needed to have been followed, and where are we today from a, from a contamination standpoint? Okay. Um, there was an, uh, an operating gas station there, and... Um, as part of the tank uh, upgrade to the newer uh, federal standards um, that were required back in the 90s, they, they found contamination associated with the underground storage tank system there. Uh, they began cleanup and investigation of the contamination they found it had reached the shallow groundwater there at the property. Um, so they put in uh, monitoring wells to define the extent of the uh, groundwater contamination um, and they began uh, treatment of the site uh, they installed a uh, under you know under state oversight they uh, were all this work they submit work plans to the, to the state to uh, uh, for approval for what work they're doing so they installed a remediation system and operated that for several years and um, until the, the until just before the gas station was uh, closed and the existing tank, the new tanks that had been put in back in the 90s were, um, were removed and assessed. So, um, so that's... So, so if I may, so yet it's, it's still an open site with institutional controls? Yeah, well, it's, it doesn't have institutional controls. It is, is an open active site. Okay. Um, so it is under under the uh, oversight of the contaminated sites program. And, it, and there's, the contamination is still impacting the groundwater and, and off property as well? Yeah, in, well, it's impacting soil and groundwater on the property. Um, I think with the initial sampling results, it did appear they had some samples that were taken right at the property boundary. So it was likely at that time that there was some contamination that extended off property. Since then, they've done quite a bit of cleanup. So the existing data has shown that 
at least with the groundwater data that has shown that the, the, the concentrations have reduced quite a bit. They do still have areas on the property that exceed cleanup levels. Um, there might be some a little bit that extends off to the uh, east side of the property by the road there. And it, for the, is there any ongoing active mitigation that's occurring on, on the site at this point? Well, in preparation for the site redevelopment, they um, decommissioned the existing treatment system and then the, they have they had discussions with me about different corrective action, different cleanup options for what's left. And so that would be, uh, they're supposed to give me a, a completed work plan by the end of this month. So the, clearly if it's being redeveloped, there's not really room to operate the system that, that was in place, but there will be steps taking, taken when they go to install the new tanks that will be in line with uh, cleaning up the site or, or doing more to, to further the cleanup of the site. That's what the work plan will be, be for. Yes, I mean, I'll be looking for them to uh, do some treatment either just before construction or concurrent with construction or, you know, possibly it could be a, operating a system or adding compounds or something to uh, enhance the remediation. I imagine as part of the construction, they will probably be removing a certain amount of contaminated soil as necessary to put in the new tanks. Okay. Um, so the, that that's part of part of DEC's oversight. We would make sure that the uh, the site development is done in such a way that it doesn't cause contamination problems. So um, any if they have to pump any water, ground, shallow groundwater, if they have to excavate any contaminated soil, that would all be part of a, a approved plan for the, that material be properly handled. So that's one of the other things that they're going to provide by the end of the month is a, a contamination management plan that you know specifically spells out what, what they do will, as part of the construction if they do encounter uh, contaminated soil or groundwater as part of the development. Most of the contamination is deeper in the ground, so most of your typical foundation work or utilities probably wouldn't encounter that, but certainly with putting in large underground storage tanks, it, you know, depending on where that's located, they're probably going to encounter some contaminated soil as part of that work. Okay, and one more, Mr. Chair, if I may. The, the, uh, I mean, would you say, obviously you're not reviewing the, the, the plan, nor is that your purpose here tonight, but I think, um, would you say, generally speaking, that the, the new development will, you know, overall uh, lead the site to, you know, towards a cleaner site, kind of be neutral, or will be will make problems worse? Is there any way that you can sort of, you know, evaluate or comment on that? Well, yeah, part of my job is to make sure it doesn't make it worse. Um, I mean, they had an existing system in there that they were operating, and it was, you know, they were trying different different ways of cleaning the site up to make progress. So they're going to continue to do that whether or not the site is developed or not. Okay. And can, and can you just, one of the things that has we've heard in further or past testimony is, you know, your relationships are with the previous owner that was the, the uh, entity that contaminated, that was responsible for the contamination, and there's sort of a new ownership group. Can you, cl can you clarify, you know, we have in front of us you know, particular ownership entity. Are you, are you, you're working with them through the work plan, but your ongoing relationship is with the former own, owner as well? Yeah, uh, that's, we, we tend to, we work with the, the, the party that's most responsible for the contamination. In this case, it's Chevron. It's their, it was their gas station that they operated. So we've been working with them since the beginning, and we, you know, tend to continue to work with them. And my understanding is that they're, they're retaining responsibility for the cleanup at the site. So we'll continue Good. to work with them, but obviously they've got to work with the new owner, you know, especially with, um, you know, putting in, some, you know, conducting the treatment and doing on ongoing monitoring at the site. Um, okay, so so the, other, the other thing that DEC would deal with, a different program than I'm in, is the underground storage tank program, and they oversee the operation of existing service station, you know, gas station sites with regulated tanks. 
So, so that would be with the new owner. You're, you yes, would that's, a, that's a responsibility with the new owner to operate uh, the, the system in a, you know, install it and operate um, their system in accordance with the state and federal laws. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone have any further questions, Mr. Strike? Yeah, just a quick question and through the chair. Arcadis, A-R-C-A-D-I-S, is that the current company that's operating this site for remediation? That's uh, one of the environmental firms that have worked with Chevron. Okay. Yeah. The information we received indicates you have been active on this site since June of 2003. I, sounds about right. I'd have to look at that. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm reading it here. So you're very familiar with this site? Yes. The question, I, have you had a chance to look at the development drawings that they've submitted in preparation for this site? I, yes, I have. I, I don't know if those are the final ones or not, but I, I got one a few weeks ago. Is, do you see an issue with the development and the ongoing remediation? No. Okay. Anybody else have any further questions? Thank you very much for your time this evening, sir. Yeah, Thank you're you. You're welcome. Staff indicated a representative from Chevron was here. Would he care to come forward? State your name and spell it for the record. Sure. It's Eric Hetrick. Last name is H E T R I C K. Eric? E R I C, yes. Thank you very much. Um, do you have a prepared statement or you want to take questions? I don't have any prepared statements, but I'm here for questions if anyone has any. Any commissioners have, have any questions? Um, I think there will be questions, but I'll, I'll start because nobody's in the queue currently. Your agreement is with the applicant and you will be operating the gas station there? Is we we will not be operating the gas station, no. Okay, you'll be providing fuel to that gas station only? Correct. And uh, who is responsible for the underground storage tanks at this gas station? It will be the property owner. It will be the property owner. So uh, you show up with a tank with fuel, you fill the tank, and you go away, and that's the limit of your operation there? Um, as far as the operation side, we will still remain as a responsible party for the cleanup of the heritage release. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes. So, so what, what's there it, it remains yours. Right. But as to the new tank, or new operation going forward, you deliver fuel to a tank and drive away. Correct. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Just uh, one point of clarification for Mr. Strike. Arcadis was the consultant that handled the operation and maintenance of the former system at the property. Our current consultant for the site is Conestoga Rovers and Associates, CRA, and you may see, I think they're listed on the figures that were provided. When, when did they start? Bill, when, when did you guys pick the site up? Late 2000s, 2009 roughly. So for the last six years, their sign has been on the gate to the property? for the operation and maintenance of the unit. So we, we put this Arcadis' sign up there because they're the point of contact if anything should happen with that former system. They've got local personnel that would handle anything, any issues. Okay. Who would be able to best tell us the relationship from Cook Inlet Marketing Group to Chevron, or I mean, to walk through, because we've got a couple of new names here thrown at us just now. Who? Uh, Steve Ellis. With, Steve? Yeah. Could you come back and answer that direct question then, if there are any further questions? Thank you very much for your testimony, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Steve Mark, Ellis is. Cook Inlet Marketing and Walk Down. Cook Inlet Marketing is an Alaska corporation that has eight shareholders, all of whom are Alaskans, most of whom were associated with Chevron and a prior professional life. Cook Inlet Marketing Group bought eight service stations from Chevron in 2004 
in 2006, they bought, or maybe it was 2005, they bought this property from Chevron. All of those agreements, all of those purchase agreements had a substantially similar contractual provision that provided as to contamination that was present at the site at the time of the purchase, that that would be Chevron's responsibility to clean up. Now, how about the operator? I, I, Cook Inlet owns a piece of property. Chevron delivers fuel. What happens in between there? I mean, somebody's got to operate the gas station, and who is that? That's Cook Inlet Marketing Group. We own, CIMG as we call it, owns and operates the facility. Chevron provides the fuel. CIMG purchases the fuel from Chevron and resells it. Does anyone else have any questions for CIMG? Going once? Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for staff? Okay. It's up to us, gang. What is the interest of the body in case 20140173, a conditional use for a service station? Mr. Cage. Thank you, Mr. The Chair. In case 20140173, I move to approve the conditional use permit subject to the conditions 1 through 14 as outlined in our staff packet. I'd be happy to go through findings once I get a second and um, Will the body. Okay, those are 1 through 14 on page 9 of the packet dated January 12, 2015. Is that correct? We have a second by Ms. Barker. Uh, Ms. Barker, do you have anything to say? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll be supporting the motion. I feel that the um, the request for the conditional use permit is fairly straightforward in light of the conditions that were outlined in the staff report. Um, we have a site that is probably, this is probably going to be its highest and best use. It puts some land back into production that otherwise may continue to be something of a blight on the neighborhood. This allows the remediation to continue while there is a new use on the property. Um, and again, again, most importantly, puts what right now is a fallow piece of land and a blighting influence in the neighborhood back into production um, in a similar use to which it was um, priorly um, engaged. Thank you very much, Mr. Robinson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'd like to um, make a motion for an amendment, um, and I, I'm sort of going to look to staff for a head nod, because I, I, my recollection back in January is not great. But I, my, my motion would be to amend condition six, where it says provide a six-foot fence along the south side of the property at the 25-foot buffer landscape line. And I, I, I think that's what we spoke about. Yeah. Um, so is that, is that right? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you're right. Just through the chair, just to uh, tag on to Tyler's amendment. I was looking at, at an old version, and, and uh, Commissioner Walker corrected me. I didn't have my notes in front of me, but I, I would um, concur with Mr. Robinson's motion on item six. Which version did you want to look at? I was looking at the original, but I've, I do recall now that we discussed that buffer being uh, at a 25-foot mark under item number six. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Um, also, I had a recommendation 15, verification of landscaping dot triangle, which I assumed to mean the landscaping had to meet the DOT um, site triangle. Yep. Is, I, is, I, I, would, I would concur with that recommendation also. Again, I was looking at some old notes from, that were on the screen, and I did not have my notes from the items we discussed in front of me. Sorry, this case has been going on. I didn't bring my all Paper my copies have some value, yes, do they, Mr. Indeed, Cage? Indeed, sometimes they do, Mr. Chair. Ms. Mr. Chair, if you look at condition 10, it says show dimension of site triangle setback. That might 
So I think the petitioner is aware that they need to provide those and show those. Okay. But did, I think you specifically wanted it to show in the landscape plan? I, I'll accept 10. Okay. I'll, I believe 10 addresses the issue there. I have another question for staff and I reluctantly asked this question. Back in January, we were moving right along promptly and the question of sandwich making in the back room came up. Where are we with sandwich making tonight? We determined that sandwich making could be done in that warehouse space, but they could only be sold on the premises there. They couldn't make sandwiches to then distribute to the other Chevron convenience stores. I, um, I don't see a, a, I understand it's, a, it's a, a gray line of when an operation becomes a food processing, a food processing, they Commercial have eight use. other gas stations we've heard testimony on. This would be a cottage industry um, that would employ people in the neighborhood of, that are looking for work that we need to have for jobs for it. Um, would they have to apply for a variance to get that done or how, I mean, if, if they wanted to ship gas sandwiches to 800 stores, I wouldn't be making this argument. But to me, that's a pickup truck coming in a day and picking up sandwiches and delivering it. And I would bet you that that happens a lot all over the city and no one well, we also factored into it, there'd be trucks that would be bringing in the bread, trucks that would be bringing in the meat, trucks that'd be bringing in the produce. You know, there, there might be quite a few trucks coming in, packaging materials, et cetera. And Mr. Chair, um, this, this would be considered an industrial use. They could not apply for a variance as there is uh, state law prohibits use variances. Um, you can't get a variance to allow a use in a district where it's otherwise prohibited. Um, they would have the option of uh, doing this um, potentially in one of their other locations where they would have a zoning district that allows it. But in the B1A, um, that type of industrial use is prohibited. I mean, there, there's another Chevron station with a uh, burrito factory in the back of it, and it seems to um, have the same issue, and yet it it is allowed to, to work on that. It, that. In that case, it may or may not be a, probably not a B1A zoning district. Okay. All right. And in answer to your question earlier, Erica has her notes from that one. And I think John Spring had said, ensure landscaping meets DOT site distance triangle for number 15. Would you like us to keep that one in? I, no, I will accept. They're going to show a, a site triangle setback on the drawings. If the landscaping doesn't meet the site triangle setback, it's going to get caught at that point. And I was answering that. I think 10 is adequate for 15. Okay. Mr. Kane, you're in the queue. Do you have anything to say? Just it, point, point, point of order, Mr. Chair. I, 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 I think unless Mr. Kane restates his main motion, I think we need to pass my We need to do something with my motion that's hanging out here right now. Um, I thought I heard Mr. Cage accept your change. Is that good enough? Yeah. Mm. So what I believe Mr. Cage made a motion was that on to accept the 14 uh, staff recommendations and then on item 6 change it to read um, south side of the property at the 25 foot existing vegetative buffer is that correct that's correct and if that captures everything that Commissioner Robinson oh, I'm good thank you okay we have a motion we had uh, by Mr. Cage and it was seconded by Miss Barker any further discussion as soon as we get it up on our machines we can vote ah there it is please vote that motion carries Mr. Cage any findings, Ms. Park? 
Thank you. And again, uh, I don't want to belabor the fact that I, I, I think that my opinion on how the site cleanup should have gone, I, I do believe that there are other mitigating factors that would reduce the traffic, the noise, and lighting to nearby residences, and that's why I supported this motion. So I believe that the information provided in our staff packet uh, complies with municipal standards, specifically 21.50.060. Okay. Ms. Barker, do you have anything? Any other commissioner want to add to the findings? Okay. Thank you very much. We next are going to take up. Um, pardon me. We got a. Um, Mr. Keynes, will you make a motion to recommend postponing case 2014-0221 to April 13th, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. With regard to case 2014-0221, I, I move to postpone that case at the request of the petitioner. Do we have a second? We have a second, Mr. Sporhees. Any objection? Seeing and hearing no objection, that case is postponed to April 13th, 2015. We next are going to take up cases 2014-0210 and cases 2014-0211. We're going to change the public hearing slightly here because we have two cases, both involving the Chugach Access Plan. We're going to have a combined public hearing for both cases. That saves you from maybe have to testifying twice. We're going to give you five minutes as an individual. 10 minutes is a meeting of um, uh, a representative of a, a body. So you get a little more time to do it. But we're going to have a combined public hearing. We will have two staff reports, and then we'll vote on each motion, each case, separately. We're doing this because we can get confused, and you can get confused if we, if we try to run them separately. So uh, staff, are we going to have uh, one or two staff reports? Through the chair, it's up to you. I can do either way. We got, we're going to have one combined staff report. May we have the staff report for case 2014-0210 and case 2014-0211? Certainly. Uh, Thede Tobish, senior planner with the Long Range Planning Division. I passed out, and hopefully you've got them now, um, a late packet that came in today, came to our attention today, a resolution from the Anchorage Board of Realtors, and it relates, as far as I can tell, to uh, case 2014-0210. <clears throat> there were also some late items that I think you got in the packet uh, on time pre prior to the meeting. So case 2014-0210, uh, as referenced, Assembly Ordinance 2014-147, we'll re I'll refer to it as the STAR Ordinance. This is an uh, ordinance changing title, the old Title 21, uh, relative to implementation for the Chugach State Park Access Plan that's before the Assembly uh, later this month. So the this case, this ordinance, amends the uh, comprehensive plan implementation section specific to the, the Chugach State Park Access Plan, 2105-135. Uh, this, this ordinance states that the comp plan is not, in fact, amended by the Chugach Access Plan and goes on to state that the area-wide trails plan is the primary basis for land use actions and new access points at the Chugach State Park interface. It creates new procedures for plat reviews uh, at sites adjacent to the state park boundary. And in detail, it, provide, it requires a site plan, and a benefits analysis for a new access point, and up to five new additional approval actions prior to going to the platting board. 
Uh, packets were sent out to the standard distribution list, municipal, state agencies, community councils. Uh, comments came in, they're in your packet, came in from several municipal agencies uh, and from two community councils, and then later on from several uh, private citizens. The comments were either neutral or, in, or uh, against this ordinance, recommending rejection. And the department recommends uh, no action, which is essentially re rejection of this ordinance. Confirming one aspect, 2014-0211 impacts the old Title 21 only. This, this case, 2014-0210, impacts the old code only. Now, wait a minute. Read that number again. 0210. Now wait, I thought, oh, t I, was a, I may have created a problem here. 0211 is the star ordinance. 0210 is the star ordinance. Okay, yes, thank you. Chair was confused. Just for reference, the, the section that this ordinance would amend in the old code does not have a corresponding parallel in the new code. Okay. Thank you. Apologize. Now, do you want to do 2014 oh. 0211? Thanks for the prompt. Yes. So, case 2014 0211. Um, bundles two ordinances, one of which was specifically the S version of the ordinance, was submitted to the, to the commission for your input to the assembly. Um, this ordinance assumes, well, it, it, it has bearing based on the assumption that the, the Chukach State Park access plan would be adopted as an element of our comp plan. The base ordinance assumes that it is to be adopted. The S version makes an assumption that it does not, be, does not require adoption as a comprehensive plan element. The base ordinance 2014-140 amends new code in two sections. It amends 2103-100, which removes, in, in specifically, it, this language removes essentially using the land use permit process for requiring state park access. And more importantly, the second section modifies new code 2108040, creates a discrete section E just for Chugach State Park access uh, and implementing the comp plan, sorry, implementing the access plan. But it adds considerable flexibility following on the commission's uh, intent from your resolution to the plotting process for access dedications. Uh, and it includes essentially one to five conditions of approval guiding the plotting process with that flexibility. The S version differs from the base version in that it does not amend or does not discuss 2103-100, the land use permit section. And it modifies 2108 in a little different way than the base ordinance. It still creates a discrete section for the Chugach State Park access plan, but it adds essentially potentially more flexibility to the plotting process, and the wording is such that it does not adopt, does not need adoption of the plan as a comprehensive plan element. So the main difference between the two you can find in the wording underlined or cap or um, bolded in sections one through six. As with the previous case, packets were sent out to <clears throat> standard distribution list and community councils. Comments came in in a similar fashion, although uh, 
two community councils favored the S version, as did the individual citizen comments. Uh, the department's stance is that following our original legal opinion from the municipal attorney, we believe that the, comp the Chugach access plan is to be adopted or should be adopted as a comprehensive plan element as a basic foundation for future dedication requirements at the state park entrance points. Um, so that we, we are actually recommending, the department recommends approval of and following the language of the base ordinance. Anything else? No, sir. Ms. Dean. Through the chair, um, my question of staff is when you say the base ordinance, you're referring to the 2014-140 non-S version. That's correct. Okay. And um, our, from what I understood, is our uh, not really a decision today? Are we looking for a decision? I know the assembly is going to be handling this at the end of the month, correct? Yes. And so they're just looking for us to give input on what we think of each ordinance. Um, is that correct? Through the chair, Ms. Dean, the assembly language of their request was not that detailed. They simply referred it to you since they, rec they consider you to be the experts on Title 21 language. So what should be our action to tonight on um, each one of these cases? Because they're separate, they require separate action, it would be our interpretation. So if the base case is the 2014-140, technically doesn't exist on this or not? Is it, is it case uh, 2014-0211 then, or kind of? Yes. Okay, so. The, both, both ordinances were, were opened, introduced by the assembly originally. The assembly closed public hearing and referred the S version, presumably as the one they favor. Maybe we should just approve all three and send them back. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and so my understanding, particularly on this first, although we're having public comment on both of these at the same time, the first case, the department is not recommending passage, correct? That's correct. And the second case you're recommending passage of? Yes. Okay. I hope we'll hold the public hearing and hopefully that may bring some clarity to us. And then we'll come back and have some more of this dialogue, I am certain. For once we're in agreement, Mr. Yeah. Chair. Okay. And we fortunately don't have 200 people out there for the public hearing. I have neglected to read the procedure. The procedure by which the public may speak to the commission at its meeting is, after the staff presentation is completed on public hearing items, the chair will ask for public testimony on this issue. Persons to wish to testify will follow the time limits established in the commission rules of procedures. Petitioners, including all of his or her representatives, 10 minutes. Representative of groups, in this case, because it's combined, get 10 minutes. Individuals get five minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An, an individual may have appeal rights relating to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes, except commission's recommendations to the assembly, which are not appealable which is what we're dealing with right tonight. Appeals may be filed by the clerk's office within 20 days after approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission of the resolution, which is the commission's final decision. A fee for the appeal is required at the time of filing. Any individual may request written findings from any commission, commission decision within seven days. I now open the public hearing for case 2014-0210 
and case 2014-0211. If you choose to testify, please step forward, state your name, and spell it for the record. Carefully step forward. Yes. Uh, my name is Susan Olson, O-L-S-E-N. I live on the hillside. I'm in Jugat State Park probably six out of seven days. Ms. Olson, thank you very much. Um, I'm keenly interested in this and have followed this plan since it was released five years ago. Uh, so I just would urge uh, the commission to do whatever is necessary to move it along so it gets to the assembly. I think we all agree that uh, additional access uh, is needed for the ease of the public as well as for protecting uh, the park resource itself. I would urge, I would support what the uh, staff is doing, but I would urge your rejection of uh, the 0210 uh, original resolution, the star resolution. I've testified, and I see my tes testimony is in the uh, packet. Um, I said it was a poison pill. I still think it's a poison pill uh, in order to kill the whole idea. It seems to me the assembly could have voted it down rather than putting a very difficult, or attempting to put a very difficult, um, I would say impossible uh, scheme in place, uh, <clears throat> even for those folks who are eager to provide access. So it seems to me the question um, is which version of the uh, 0211, the one that requires uh, adoption by the assembly of the Chugach access plan or uh, the substitute, um, which does not require adoption by the assembly. And I would simply urge the commission to adopt the S version. Um, I, I think, and I'm sure others will, will testify to this, that getting the, um, uh, for the assembly to adopt the plan, and this is a state plan, uh, what are the complications further down the line when State Parks decides to amend that plan? It seems to me they're just unnecessary uh, complications if you adopt uh, that version compared to the other one, which I understand works, uh, or w would work, hopefully, uh, when it gets in place. Thank you. I do, so, so maybe you can, since you've been involved in this in the last five years through the chair, your recollect, or your coming out here to speak in opposition of 2010 and you're thinking that recommending this to the assembly in the second version, the S version, is the right way to go and maybe you, yes. can you elaborate on the reason why? Well, just because of, well, I think uh, 2010, um, Two zero one zero doesn't work, and in fact, is is a total disruption to any possible uh, access. Uh, so the difference between the two zero two elevens, um, I would go with the substitute because it doesn't require the assembly to adopt the plan, um, and I think there's much more flexibility in that. Uh, in that uh, version of the ordinance. Um, so I would urge that that be the one that works. The, um, though I did not hear the testimony from various people who are opposed to the access plan, um, it does seem to me that the concern that was expressed as I heard about it uh, was that, you know, they'd be bulldozed, there'd be you know, roads running right through it. I think the criteria that are spelled out in S give all kinds of considerations that have to be um, uh, looked at and agreed upon before access is required. So it seems to me there are enough safeguards there. Thank you, Thank you very much. For your okay. Next person, please step forward. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, um, the reason we don't have 200 people here is we wanted you to. Please state your name. I'm sorry, it's Julian Mason, M A S O N. 
we don't have 200 people here because we wanted, we've done this before and we just wanted to deal with specific, with specific questions, but we appreciate your invite, inviting us back again. Uh, it would be very helpful to me if the commissioners could have in front of them as I talk 140S, which is, it's in your pocket, uh, in your packet, and it'll have a big G4 in the upper right corner. <clears throat> Uh, just to begin with, that's it. I want to refer to these sort of by names because I think it's going to help. People are all over confusing the numbers. I'm here in support of the Jennifer, of the Evans, I'm sorry, Johnston Evans substitute, which is 140S. I'm just going to call it Johnston Evans. I'm going to call star star, and I'm going to call the other one base, the one that is referred to as 140, not the substitute. I don't know why you have that on your agenda. It was never moved by the assembly. It does not have a sponsor. Johnston is no longer sponsoring it. And by definition, the substitute version replaces it. It really is not before the assembly. Um, let me talk quickly about the STAR ordinance. It would create a quagmire for anybody trying to develop their property. Your staff has analyzed that, I think, correctly. Uh, the Board of Realtors has analyzed it correctly, and nobody has spoken in favor of it. It would, truly would just be a quagmire. Um, the Johnston Evans Ordinance applies only if property is subdivided. It doesn't affect anybody sitting on their lot with their house. The Johnston Evans Ordinance is the only one that does not bog the municipality and the state down in trying to adopt the Chugach State Park Access Plan. I'm a great supporter of the Access Plan, but I've watched what we've gone through now for multiple years about what happens if the state amends it, what happens if the municipality adopts it, and then the state amends it, what happens if the municipality adopts it, and then it tries to amend it. It's a quagmire. And we should not, in trying to provide access to the park, require the municipality to adopt the Chugach State Park access, uh, access Plan, and that's the only ordinance that doesn't require that. Now, you have heard from staff, and I mean no disrespect, but you've heard that there is a legal opinion that in order to provide access, that it's necessary that the plan be adopted. That is simply not the case. If you look in the upper right-hand corner of the ordinance, you will see that it was drafted by Mr. Wheeler. It's the only one that was drafted by the legal department. And in the text of the ordinance, it says access, I'm paraphrasing, access shall be provided subject to the terms and conditions of the ordinance. It is not any longer, it used to be, but it's no longer necessary for the assembly to adopt the access plan in order to provide, or, in order to provide access to the park. The, at the work session, there were some questions about landowner liability if access were granted. The short answer is there isn't any. Our statutes protect very well against that. But later, Tom Meacham will testify to you very specifically about that. You just don't need to worry about it. The landowner is well protected. Now, in the S version of the ordinance, there is a provision on the second page of it having to do with using the permitting process to provide access. And that has been stricken from the S version of the ordinance. You can see it right here. I believe that your staff wants that in. That was stricken by Mr. Wheeler. He struck it. And the reason he struck it is that the reference, the section that it applies to on the first page, is only for off-site improvements. The section that has been stricken has no applicability. There's no way that the permitting process under the section that references can be used to require access to the park. It's off-site improvements only. It's the sort of thing that happens, he tells me, if, um, if a developer is developing a big subdivision and it may require adjustments in the streets or the traffic patterns or the signs or the roads, there may be a requirement imposed on the developer to provide the signs, to pay for the signs, or, or redesign of the roads, off-site improvements. So it's stricken, it's stricken by the municipal attorney because it's really, it's not, it's not appropriate there, and it doesn't apply to anything that's a problem. Um, 
Summarize very quickly, please. Yeah. We've been at this now for 10 years. You've been at it for three, roughly. And I hope that you will endorse to the Assembly 140S and reject the other two. That's the action that we ask out of you tonight. Thank you very much. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. hear you very well, Mr. Ferguson. State your name for the record, please. My name is Diane Holmes, and um, I'm sorry I won't take up the full five minutes. I only have 350 words, but maybe I'll have time for a joke or something at the end. And I'm really sorry that some of you were still in college when this first came up. Maybe we can put it to rest in the next couple of weeks. There does appear to be some confusion as the purpose of the cap. Um, basically, I view it as a way to provide access to landlocked land. Now, try thinking of these lands in question as being owned by Connie Yoshimura or Mark Pfeffer. If that was so, we wouldn't be having this lengthy discussion, would we? If you believe that people should have access to public lands, just like a private landowner would, then it should be easy for you to vote for the Johnston Evans substitute version. And then why? Because it outlines in the simplest way for the plowing board to deal with access when lands come up before them for subdividing. The other case by Starr proposes a convoluted lengthy process with uh, approval acquired by DNR, the assembly, and two park departments. And it would impose a financial burden on the city to design the access. None of those things are gonna happen in our lifetime. We know that. Some of you have asked about right-of-way liability, as um, Julian Mason described, and he's better able to tell you, along with Tom Meacham, who will probably speak at the end if you really have more detailed questions. But this is an issue, not an issue because there are three state statutes that grant immunity to the landowner. If you believe the cap provides potential and reasoned access that the platting, that platting should consider, then do not adopt the cap as an element of the comp plan, as your staff report recommends. Why? Very simply because it is a given that the amendments will soon follow to delete many access points, thus watering down our ability to get to the park and putting more pressure on the few remaining points. And platting does not need this to be adopted for them to consider access to a landlocked owner. The only thing that gives me pause is that there is no requirement for a professional trail or road engineer to give input to platting before access is deleted, and they can delete. You may have heard me say before that we lost a critical second access to Little Rabbit Creek Greenbelt because one or two people said it was too steep to do so to build this here before the platting board some just a couple years ago. And then platting, without consulting a professional, agreed. This photo, this photo shows steep, narrow access can be accommodated. So please add one simple sentence that before access is deleted, professional consultation should have input. The cap is for the long term as I would expect your wishes for the park would be also. So please adopt Johnson and Evans Eschver's version with an added clause for, pro for professional consultation before deleting access. Thank you. Any questions? 
I have a couple. Why she used the term landlocked in regards to the Chugach access. Chugach is not landlocked. There are multiple access points to it. So how do you reach the conclusion that it is landlocked? It's not reasonable for residents to have to go to Glen Alps and fight the traffic because there are only very few access points. And, and the Hillside District Plan calls for more, more frequent and smaller access points to spread out the usage and the traffic. And, and I believe in the comp plan, but I can't remember the policy number right now. Also, perhaps Mr. Robinson or Mr. Mr. Tobish can enlighten us. And so if you go by just the Hillside District Plan, we do need more frequent, smaller access points. My concern with the Chugach Access Plan is that it provides no access on the other side of the line. All the access is on the citizen side of the line. And to me, a true access plan should show access on the other side, roads on their side that would bring it in beyond the border. And that's my reservation with the Chugach access plan is they made the opinion that, oh, everything has to be on the, the citizen side of the line. But you have to start somewhere, Mr. Ferguson, and you have to get there to the boundary. Then we will hold Chugach's feet to the fire to give us more trails, more parking. But you've got to get there first. And I believe Title 21 does call for granting of access when you have properties abutting against um, the, the park. But perhaps Mr. Meacham can enlighten you. We have no other questions. Thank you for your testimony. Good evening. Is that back up on the podium if it helps? Okay. Um, my name is Helen Neenhauser, and I'm here tonight to represent the Rogers Park Community Council. Our council meets tonight, so my our president asked me to come. Um, we considered both of these ordinances at our meeting in January, I guess it was, just before your deadline. Uh, for comments, and um, we passed the following resolution, which I'd like to read to you. Whereas access to Chugat State Park is important to the quality of life for many current and prospective Anchorage residents, whereas existing access points are often overcrowded, whereas in some parts of the municipality of Anchorage there are few official access points and considerable acreage in large parcels that are privately owned and either undeveloped or have limited development. Whereas it is anticipated that over time many of these large parcels will be subdivided. Whereas the Alaska Department of Natural Resources has adopted the Chugach Access Plan, which identifies needed and feasible access points to Chugach State Park. Whereas there has been controversy over a request that the municipality adopt the Chugach Access Plan. Whereas two ordinances have been introduced in the Anchorage Assembly to address this issue, Johnston Evans and the Star, um, and refer to the Planning and Zoning Commission, whereas the Rogers Park Community Council has reviewed and compared these draft ordinances. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Rogers Park Community Council supports the Johnston Evans Amendment as a reasonable compromise that does not require that the municipality adopt the Chugach Access Plan but does require that the municipality's platting authority consider the Chugach Access Plan in the review of and action on subdivisions at or near the Chugach Park boundary, thus ensuring that the opportunity for access will be considered. 
Further, the Rogers Park Community Council opposes the STAR Amendment, which does require that the municipality adopt the Chugach Access Plan and requires a process so complex, so onerous, so difficult, that official access is unlikely to be created. This resolution passed the Rogers Park Community Council January 12, 2013 by a vote of 20 yeas, zero nays, and three abstentions. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, through the chair. Um, one of the recommendations in the S version talks about uh, through the through the process of providing access, having recommendations from affected community councils and advisory boards entitled to notice under certain sections of the code. I think the insinuation there is that those community councils would be the adjacent community councils of a particular area. I'm I'm curious to think, you know, to get your opinion from as a Rogers Park resident, if you thought there was access going away, do you think your community council would be affected? by those decisions? Absolutely, we're affected by those decisions, uh, as are the people living nearby. But the bulk of the people that use Chugach State Park do not live next to the park, which is why we need these access points. I mean, the people who live next to the park do use it, but they're a minority of people. The density is in Midtown, where we are and lots of us go there. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Chair uh, and members of the uh, commission, my name is Tom Meacham, and I have a handout here. I'm not sure I have enough copies for everyone. I think there are 10 of them here. My intention was to address some of the issues that had come up in the work session, but first I'd like to say that I uh, am fully in support of the uh, Johnston Evans S version. I think the complications of trying to adopt the state park plan as a municipal plan and the complications that would arise if either of the entities tried to amend it in the future uh, are really insurmountable, and they're not uh, they're not needed in order for the 140s uh, version to take effect. Um, I am also opposed to the star uh, ordinance because it is simply unworkable, and I think even uh, the uh, Anchorage Board of Realtors has recognized the kind of perpetual cloud on uh, real estate transactions that would be uh, uh, incurred if that were adopted or were recommended for adoption. Uh, the questions I was going to address dealt with uh, basically some legal questions. What's the difference between uh, an easement to Chugach Park and a right-of-way? And <clears throat> as you know, an easement's a right of a person to use a landowner's land. However, title to the underlying land remains in the landowner, but is subject to the easement. And the reason this might be important for flexibility purposes is if a subdivider has to meet certain square footage minimums for his lots and the granting of a right-of-way, which would mean that he would grant title to access to the park would reduce the square footage, he might decide that it would be better to uh, grant an easement and he could count that square footage as part of uh, his lot sizes, and yet there would be a public access to the park. Um, if an easement is granted rather than a right-of-way, then certain questions arise concerning liability for accidents, injuries, uh, maintenance, and so forth, and I've tried to address these. Uh, who's responsible for constructing the easement? Uh, if it's either an easement or a right-of-way, the construction of the access would be the responsibility of the park, not the landowner. It would be just as if a, uh, uh, a sewer line uh, easement were granted across a person's property. The landowner doesn't have the responsibility of putting in the sewer line. Who is responsible for maintaining the easement? Again, whether it's an easement or a right-of-way, the parks uh, would be responsible for maintenance. And they have trail crews that work on park access and park uh, trails every summer. Who has liability if someone gets hurt? 
If it's a right-of-way, the adjacent landowner would have no responsibility because he or she does not own the land. If it's an easement, then the provisions of Alaska Statutes 0965-200 would apply. This statute grants a landowner immunity from civil actions for personal injury or death of third parties that occur on a landowner's unimproved land if, one, the injury or death resulted from a natural condition of the unimproved portion of the land or the person entered for the purpose of recreation, and, two, the landowner did not charge money for the privilege of entering the land. And in that statute, the definition of unimproved land includes land that has a trail on it. And there's additional tort uh, liability immunity if uh, the landowner uh, um, allows recreational use of his land without charge except if there's uh, something uh, involved of the landowner's intentional reckless, reckless or grossly negligent activity. Also, if there's a conservation easement granted by the landowner, then there are additional protections under the statute. But basically, the answer is if the, if the landowner grants an easement rather than granting a right-of-way uh, for the purpose of a trail to Chugat State Park, which is a recreational use, there are uh, provisions in the statutes that protect that landowner from uh, liability to third, per third parties. Uh, who has the authority to close the easement if it becomes unsafe? Chugat State Park would have that authority, whether it's an easement or right-of-way. Uh, who builds the trail and who maintains it? The critical issue here is initially the establishing the legal right of access. If it's an easement or a right-of-way, uh, if it becomes needed for access to the park, it would be built and maintained by the park or by citizen volunteers. It would certainly not be the obligation of the landowner. The same uh, would apply with regard to the collection of trash and, and uh, anything uh, related to that that might uh, happen within that easement. Uh, in conclusion, I would urge you to adopt two resolutions, one recommending the rejection of the STAR ordinance and two, recommending the, uh, to the assembly that it adopt the 140S version. Finish quickly, please. Beg pardon? Finish quickly. Please. Okay, I, uh, I only had one other comment, and that was that the municipal ordinances do not define uh, landlocked parcels as, as uh, the only kind of parcel that needs to have access to it. The connectivity uh, requirements of the statute fairly clearly set out uh, the obligation of the planning and planning departments in providing connectivity to uh, adjacent parcels, whether they're landlocked or not. And that's all I have. Uh, I'd be happy to answer questions. Any questions? I see no questions in the queue. Thank you. For Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair. My name is Corey Hines, H-I-N-D-S. Uh, I'm going to keep these remarks short and kind of cut to the chase here. I um, <clears throat> believe that the 2014-147-2010 uh, ordinance has got many problems. I did it, attend the work session, and uh, I heard this group address those. Um, the other two ordinances... Seems to be some confusion on whether 140 is even on the floor, but certainly the S version um, requires that, that you dedicate uh, <clears throat> at, and provide public access, uh, and, and it does so in a much better way. It, it provides a, a logical, workable, and I believe a fair and balanced consideration of, of the need for a developer to... to uh, to complete his transaction, and it also provides uh, the public's need to gain access, and it, it provides additional criteria that are in the ordinances that uh, provide <clears throat> for protection of private property rights. Now, uh, both are clearly better than 147, but here, here's the chase. 140 requires implementation of the, of the Chugach State Park access plan. It's in the language, implementation. 140S requires consideration. And Mr. Kange asks, you know, why, why do we support 140S? Really the chase, you know, the, the bottom line here is that consideration is enough to, to, for, for us to be happy. We are, we are okay with the, with the program of bringing our, our concerns to a platting board, and we, we are comfortable with that forum of, 
we know that you'll listen to our, our arguments and we will hash it out and we will find out if a certain access point is needed in an area or is not needed. <clears throat> so you've heard you know, that there's some problems with the municipal adoption of the state plan. Um, this 140S version, it gets the job done, it provides flexibility, it keeps a state plan intact while allowing for appropriate municipal vetting via the platting board. So on behalf of the Chugach Park Access Coalition and the Mountaineering Club of Alaska, I would request that you please consider sending your approval of the 140S version to the assembly. And thank you for your good work. Any questions? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Anybody else care to testify? Anybody else at all? Going once, going twice, going three times. Public testimony is now closed. We've been here since 5.30. It's almost two and a half hours we've sat up here. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and continue this case. I call the meeting back to order. We've had the public hearing. We will now take up case 2014-0210. Um, what is the wish of the body? Mr. Cange. Thank you through the chair with regard to case 2014-0210. Because a positive motion is required, I move to approve uh, the draft amendment, although I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. You did that very well, Mr. Walker. I, I second the motion. I will not be supporting it. Anyone have anything further to say on case 2014-0210? And I remind the the mover that you'll probably need some findings thank you mr chair i was just going to jump into that i won't be supporting this uh, based on public testimony and comments that were submitted to us in our staff packet and here uh, laid on the table um, and also staff's findings outlined in our staff packet specifically page six uh, and i base my um, support or lack of support for this motion on those findings. Mr. Walker, do you have anything to say? I uh, know I just echo uh, what Mr. Kane said and that this um, of the two alternatives, this one that we are not supporting or that <laughs> that I am not supporting uh, seems to be um, pretty convoluted and um, Anyone have any further findings? Uh, well, no, it would be early on that. Anything have any further to say before we vote on case 2014-0210? We have a motion to approve by Mr. Cange, though he indicated he would not be backing it. Please use your machines. That motion is down to defeat. Um, we heard Mr. Cange's findings and Mr. Walker. Do we have any further findings on that? Seeing and hearing none, we go to case 2014-0211. Mr. Cange again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. With regard to case 2014-0211, I move to approve the recommendation to the assembly with regard to that case, for lack of a better word. And please clarify what you mean by recommendation. <laughs> Let me pull my document up, one second. Question? Yeah. <laughs> Let me restate my motion. I think, I think it could help. Mr. Chair? Yes? Over here, staff. Push your button. It helps me find you. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, my machine wasn't working. Okay. Uh, may I make a point of clarification, please? Yes. 
Thank you. Um, there was discussion in the public testimony in the, on this ordinance relative to Section 1, the improvements section of the new code 2103-100E. And I wanted to bring to your attention that the item, the new item G that is in the base ordinance but is stricken from the S version was specifically added in direct response to an overwhelming uh, input from the Chugach Eagle River Advisory Board. It was one of their major, probably their major concern with the document, the access plan. And we yeah. worked with them to provide that additional item to amend that section of the code. You're saying uh, item G as in, in uh, section one, E, three, item G, that's stricken? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay, so you'd like to add that back in? Or leave it. This, the department's recommendation would be to keep that in whichever you adopt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I like to amend my motion, my original motion. Uh, just a second here. Um, I don't believe any one group, short of the Planning and Zoning Commission, has the authority to. Um, I mean, they're all equal out there. All the public testimony is equal here. Uh, is that a, are you making that as a staff recommendation now? Um, or would you please, I mean, the way you preface it gives me great pause um, if, on that. Ms. McConnell? Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, I think you've heard through the however many years the to get to access plan and, and associated issues have come before you that there's concerns um, among various members of the public and as we expressed in the work session we had with you a couple weeks ago it was never the intent of the planning department to implement or consider the to get to access plan when uh, reviewing and approving land use permits I would point out that on, uh, and I'm looking at the S version right now, the Johnston Evans version, on uh, lines 22 through 24 of page one, the purpose of the section improvements associated with land use permits does include provide for dedications or improvements which are directly proportional to the development's demands for public infrastructure improvements. So as this was a concern to people in the community who found that possibility threatening to them and we can assure them through a, a simple amendment to code that that's the, the thing that they are fearing is not going to happen. Um, we felt that this was an, an easy and useful amendment to code. And so, yes, it is the uh, department's recommendation that section E, 3G, which is on page 2, line 16 through 20, uh, it, it is the department's recommendation that that, that excuse me, that that language be uh, retained if the commission decides that they uh, plan to recommend the S version. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Mr. Cange, uh, you were restating your motion. Uh, yeah, let me restate because I think there, I, I want to make sure my motion recommends approval of the S version. So I, I'd like to restate my recommendation that we move forward with case 2014 0211. My motion is to recommend to the assembly approval of AO number 2014-041S. As shown on pages 11 through 15. Correct. Keeping um, Section 1, E, 3, G, keeping that language as recommended by staff. So. And I, I think in, in e, my, three, that's e, my motion, and I, I would speak to that motion. If okay, I'm just want. trying to clarify in my mind. Then E, 3, G is not deleted by your motion. Correct. It stays as recommended by staff. And then I'll speak to that 
Okay, you, you have a second. Now, can I ask you one further question? Would it be appropriate at this time to clarify either with this motion or with the subsequent motion that we are not approving 2014-0140? Correct, Mr. Chair. My motion was, that's why I, I clarified. And then I assume there will be a second motion clarifying the status of 140. If that's the will of God. I think, I think. If we need it. If, it, if uh, as stated, every time it was stated it increased five years, I noticed that. But I think it's been 25 years, but I don't like things that come back five times. I, and that, that's where we are with this one. So I want to get rid of it once and for all. Okay. So, my, But my motion was specifically to uh, recommend moving 140S okay. to the assembly. Okay, uh, let me go to Ms. McConnell, then we'll come back to you. Ms. McConnell, you're in the queue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to clarify that um, as 140 and 140S were provided as part of one case, which is 2014-0211, it would be appropriate to only make one motion on this case, and if it is the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation to the assembly to adopt 140S, we would consider 140 dead, gone, not All right, thank you for that necessary. clarification. We'll follow your advice. Okay, Mr. Cage. Thank you, through the chair. As this is a recommendation to the assembly, I will be supporting this motion, including the um, staff's recommendation to keep the language in under section 1E3G, um, because it's overwhelmingly supported by public testimony supported by um, two of the community councils who we've heard from this evening, and it's supported uh, by staff's testimony. Mr. Walker, do you have anything to say? Uh, only uh, to echo Mr. Cage's comments and uh, point out again that this is the alternative that seems to have the most support from the public and from the staff and seems to be in the public's best interest. Okay. Anyone else have any comments before we use our machines? Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be supporting um, the motion as stated. Um, I just would like to add that the criteria that is um, added within this ordinance provides um, uh, provides sort of a, a, a game plan and process through which the platting board uh, can approach subdivisions that occur um, when adjacent to Chugach uh, State Park. And I think ultimately uh, it will provide for a balanced approach um, to both access and individual the needs of individual property owners. Thank you very much. Ms. Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, will be supporting the motion. I feel that the... Um, the proposed ordinance resolves some of the issues with respect to the tension between adopting a state plan and making it a part of the, um, the comprehensive plan. With all due respect to the legal department, I feel that that's um, problematic and this version addresses that. Um, it also provides for certain other measures, including coordination with the Chugach Access Plan, which provides for the measure of flexibility for state government to um, re re to um, amend the plan, to um, refine the plan is the word I'm looking for um, uh, periodically. And also it makes very clear to the public that this is not a process of requiring an exaction the time of a, of a, of a subdivision of land adjacent to the, um, to the state park. So I, I will be supporting it. Thank you. Any other comments before we use our machine? Any other comments at all? Please use your machine. That motion has passed. Do we have any further findings on that case? I would, miss, I would like to make two findings. I would ask that the packet that goes forward to the assembly include the memorandum we received from Dennis Wheeler regarding um, the um, 
easement and discussing the consequences um, about the uh, disagree about potential access points, I would ask to go forward on that. And second of all, we heard testimony about what happens if we sign and the state doesn't sign or the state signs and we don't sign because we can't control the state. I would ask that the city consider signing second, which should bring some pressure upon the state to sign it. Otherwise, we could end up signing it and then the state walk away from it and I don't know what our situation is. So if we sign second, we at least force the state to act on that. Um, before adjourn, I would ask by the time the next we have our next meeting, the commissioners please look at the committees and indicate which ones you're interested in, which ones you don't, which ones you want off on. And I remind you, I will draft you if you don't make some suggestions. And I may not draft you on one you want, so look through the committees. I would hope that you would also make suggestions which ones are not necessary. And do that, Mr. Sporhees. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I was thinking as an additional committee, I don't know what happened to the traction to the highway to highway project. Does anyone ever follow up on that? Or is that pretty much shelved? That would probably be AMATS and, and that would probably be, yeah, um, on that one. And then, Mr. Robinson, you had a committee, and I don't have it in front of me. You thought we should form, but I'll get back to you on that. Yeah, no, it had to do, I mean, I would actually scratch a number of those because um, we really haven't been meeting on a number. We can discuss it next week, but the one I talked about had to do with implementation of our comprehensive plan elements and then ensuring that those plan elements are actually incorporated into the CIP or at least looked at during the CIP process. That would be very helpful. Ms. Barker? As we discussed at the work session recently, I would sure like to see us have a committee that tracks housing. Track housing, yes, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Walker, I believe I have a motion from you to adjourn. A motion by Mr. Strike. Any objection? We are adjourned. <laughs>